So, uh, yes, I'm going to talk about detecting anomalies on the automobile control bus with machine learning. So this is um, this will be like a narrower uh, discussion than I think we saw in the morning, uh, but maybe that's good. So you can see uh, kind of a specific example of applying machine learning in the cyber domain. So uh, this work is uh, uh, DRDC has a program in cybersecurity, and a big part of that program is uh, platform uh, cybersecurity. And in the military, that means trucks and planes and cars and all that kind of stuff. So uh, cars are a really good place to start because they're open, they're unclassified, and uh, they're easy to take apart. Although I didn't do that, uh, but I did a lot of other stuff. OK, so the outline is, uh, what is the problem? It's defending cars against cyber attacks. So I'm going to talk about uh, explaining how modern cars depend on computers and how uh, hackers have demonstrated uh, exploiting those computers to cause cyber physical effects. Um, our approach was to detect those attacks with machine learning. And I'll talk briefly about how that works. And then uh, the biggest, most interesting part to me is once you've got that thing working, how, well, uh, how can you figure out how well it's working? Um, and and that, that's maybe the bigger problem in this space. So your car, all cars, uh, most cars have the, uh, uh, the controller area network bus. And if it's not that bus, it's a similar bus. So what that is is a standard, an electrical standard, uh, for communicating uh, reliably between computers. So a modern car could have a dozen computers, some maybe even 50 computers. These can be distributed throughout the car. So there's big ones that control your, your engine, uh, maybe little ones that control things like the door locks. Um, and in, uh, even your gas pedal may have a computer that talks to the engine rather than having a direct control line. And generally speaking, the more uh, up-to-date modern your car is, uh, the more expensive it is, uh, it's more likely to have more of these computers controlling more physical things. So if you have, for example, lane keep assist, that will nudge your car back into lane if you let it drift. Um, it's one of those devices on this bus. So there's generally two buses. Uh, there's a high-speed one where all the powertrain stuff happens and a low-speed one for all the cabin control features. These are connected through a gateway. So uh, the first line of defense is that your engine is not directly connected to your head unit, which is connected uh, via a cellular link to you know, the world at large. But they are connected. So on that bus, uh, that, uh, the CAN standard defines a, a packet structure. So for what I'm going to be talking about, all you need to know is that that packet is a bunch of bits. Uh, a lot of them are, are control overhead, uh, error correction, that kind of stuff. But <clears throat> there's two uh, important things for the application layer, and that is an ID that associates that message with either a particular control unit or, uh, uh, or some kind of mechanism in the car. Um, and the second part is the payload, which can be, can be nothing or could be up to 64 bits in the basic standard. And that's where the application designer is going to put whatever information they need to communicate, whether that's sending a message about uh, what's going on in the engine or sending a control message to, say, uh, turn on the brakes. So if you uh, record the traffic going on in your car, uh, it, this is an illustration of, 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 uh, of a particular car. It's a Ford Explorer uh, of the high speed and low speed bus when the driver turns the ignition on. So when you put the key in, there's a bunch of traffic. And then about a third of the way through that top picture, uh, you can see there's a, a, a whole burst of activity. But once the car is in a running state, the important thing to notice is the traffic is at a very consistent rate. So uh, we, talk, we heard about this this morning that when uh, when you've got machine-to-machine -machine traffic, things are much uh, more stable, consistent, and predictable than in other domains. And that makes this domain particularly amenable to uh, a machine learning approach to detecting problems. So that's you know, very high level how a car uh, works and how your computers are making your car work. So how do we hack cars? So at this point, as far as I know, uh, all the car hacking that's gone on has been done by security researchers. So these are people who are paid to investigate uh, what could go wrong in your car. So what do they do? Uh, step one is to access the electronics in the car. So this could be um, literally physically plugging into the car. So there's a diagnostic port. Uh, on, and this is a standard. It has to be there under your steering wheel. 
Uh, mechanics will use uh, that to plug their diagnostic tools in. Also, insurance companies will plug uh, a dongle into that device and give you a discount on your driving. But uh, that port has direct access in many cars to the control bus, to the high-speed bus in your car. Uh, another option would be the telematics system. If you have OnStar or something similar, um, those systems are connected to cellular networks. And those, there was actually an example of hackers that use that cellular connection in uh, Jeep Cherokee to uh, access the head unit of a car, and from there they could do this other stuff. Okay, so once you've got into the electronics of the car, the next step is to get onto that bus, the control bus. So typically those external systems are not directly connected to the bus, so you have to do some kind of leapfrogging. But once you have access, uh, I should say too, when you get that, uh, that external access, say it's to the head unit, the attacker has to uh, put some kind of malware on there and, and, and take control. So historically, I mean, I think things are getting better as people are aware of this, um, what's going on, but uh, those, that hacking example I just mentioned, those guys found that their head unit on that car was wide open. You could just log in with root privileges and execute arbitrary code. So I think they were actually disappointed because they were looking for a challenge and found out that it was wide open. So that's been closed. Um, once you've got that level of access, you have to get onto the CAN bus. So typically those, those external units are connected to some kind of device on the bus that has a CAN controller. So you have to go through the same process again where you have to figure out how to get some kind of malware onto that device that's actually touching the control bus. Once you've got to that point, uh, the final step in causing an effect is to send packets. So you could either be flooding the bus with extra packets that are control messages to uh, uh, you know, if you've got a lane keep assist, you could tell the car to, uh, you know, steer hard left. Or if, uh, uh, in a more general example, you could tell the engine to uh, change its timing to stall it or maybe rev the RPMs and suddenly the driver's got an out of control car. So that's the chain of events. Now I should say at this point, every car has a totally different proprietary standard for how it works internally. So. Going through this, uh, this chain, at least in the examples we've seen so far, it takes about a year uh, for a couple of very skilled researchers. So I don't want you to worry about your car right now, but you know, it's something we're all beginning to think about. So uh, the part of the problem that we looked at was the um, very last step. So to secure your car, you need to deal with security, like we saw this morning, at the perimeter, at the internal systems, and on the network. Um, so that is what a complete solution looks like. What I'm going to talk about is just the, the, the network part. So when uh, an attacker is, on the, is, is causing something to happen, based on what we've seen, we can, we can make some uh, general statements about what we would see on the bus. And generally, you either see extra packets appearing where they shouldn't be, uh, packets that you expected to appear don't appear, or uh, the most difficult case is when uh, the packet chain uh, timing doesn't change at all, but something unusual is going on in that messaging. So that's a scenario where uh, an attacker perhaps gets direct access to the control unit that's sending the messages that they want to exploit normally. So they would allow the normal message train to, to process until uh, process to occur until uh, some trigger event causes them to change the messaging to cause some kind of effect. So for those first two kinds of changes, uh, because the traffic is so regular, it's actually very easy to detect any kinds of changes with uh, statistical tests. So that's not a particularly big challenge, at least for those messages that uh, uh, are periodic. So for that, the last part, the data changes is more challenging because, as I mentioned, every car manufacturer has a totally different proprietary standard for how their car works. So. Um, one of the things we wanted to do was develop a solution that would work on any car. And that's something neural networks are good at because they can learn uh, and you don't necessarily have to tell them uh, what the meaning of what they're learning is. So the other uh, thing that makes that approach good in this situation is that we have um, as basically unlimited data for what normal operation in the car looks like because nobody's hacking cars right now outside of this security research community. But, um, and we have no examples, basically no examples of attacks. So that's a perfect situation for anomaly detection. 
So uh, our solution is to train a neural network to uh, look at uh, incoming a packet sequences and try and predict what the next packet's going to be. So it, it will do that continuously. Uh, you compare the predicted packet with what the actual packet was, feedback that error signal as a training uh, indicator, and over time, the recurrent neural network will learn to predict exactly what's going to come out of your car uh, on the bus. And it gets surprisingly good at doing that, at least we found. Then when it's time to uh, look for anomalies, you just, instead of looking at the uh, inst instead of giving it feedback, you look at that difference between what the predicted packet actually was and uh, and what the actual packet was, and if they are wildly different, then that is an indication that something strange is happening. So that's great. Um, and here's an example of uh, the network's uh, prediction errors for a bunch of different kinds of anomalies. Now these aren't these are like putting the sequence of of, uh, of control traffic in reverse or changing some random bits, or taking two different uh, sequences from different points in time and interleaving them as though you had two competing sources of traffic on the bus. And in all those situations, uh, for this example, the neural network does a great job of identifying uh, that something weird is happening. But how do you know that it's actually going to do a good job when it's an attack? Because these are all kind of ridiculous contrived examples of anomalies. So this is the thing with anomaly detection. Um, how do you test it? And more importantly, how do you decide uh, where the threshold is? So here's an example of a, uh, two distributions of the output of an anomaly signal from a system. And uh, there's histograms showing normal and anomaly scores. Well, you can see that they overlap. So if you're going to make, I mean, this is a problem in, in any domain like this. Uh, how, how do you decide where you're going to put the threshold for the decision? Because if you put it, you know, no matter where you put it, you're going to make some mistakes. So where you put it, the decision about where to put it is, has to be based on what kinds of mistakes you can tolerate. So and that boils down to the false positive rate and the uh, true positive rate. So how many things are you willing to accept that aren't real incidents versus how many things are you willing to miss? So that rock is a way of, it's a receiver operating characteristic. It plots those two things against each other as you vary that de decision threshold. So just for the, like my last slide, I'll just let you know that using that rock is one way to compare two different anomaly detectors or different situations. Uh, and a way to summarize a rock is to just add up the area under the curve. So that's area under curve. Area under curve, 0.5 is the worst you could do. One is the best you could do. OK, so what we did was simulate. We simulated attacks. And instead of doing those contrived examples, we looked at examples of exactly what's going on uh, when people do attacks and tried to make those kinds of changes within uh, the data uh, train of, of those sequences. And if you do that enough times, then you can gather enough like statistically meaningful information to build that histogram um, and then compare results across a bunch of different changes. And what that allows you to do is, so, that, so this is just a table, it's color, colors represent numbers, where yellow is really good and green is really bad, uh, showing for different kinds of situations where the detectors we built did well and, and where they don't. So, uh, and it, and when you take this approach, then we can see that in some cases, it's uh, particular ID seem to be harder to break than others. And uh, in other cases, there's particular kinds of changes to the, to the data that are harder to break than others. But once you've got this information, you can take it forward and uh, figure out where you want to spend time to make things better. So um, I think I'll leave it at that, because I believe I'm out of time. And I'll look forward to your questions at the end.